if you ever need help, we, we are able to put these webinars on for free because we uh, provide service to lab companies. And so we love your business. Um, we do medical laboratory recruiting and staffing. If you need, uh, need a scientist in your lab, we'd be happy to help. We work on a contingent basis and only, only charge a fee if we're able to deliver. Um, we also provide the medical laboratory directors to more clear labs in the country than anyone else. We can help with LDT validation, lab setup. Um, Beacon LIF is our laboratory software. We've got a revenue cycle management division that helps with uh, making sure that you're billing and coding correctly and getting paid what you should. We've got a market access payer strategy team that helps with getting you in network. So if you ever need help with any of those, I hope you'll think of us. Uh, but today is just about um, what these presenters are going to be bringing forward. So before we get into that, just going over a few different housekeeping things. Uh, reduce your buffering, close down anything else you have running if you're seeing slow with speeds or lag. Um, most common question is always whether this will be recorded and available later. Yes, it's uh, recorded. No, you don't need to do anything to get a copy of it. We will be sending you a link to the recording and then uh, recording of all past webinars always uh, exist on our YouTube channel. So the Lighthouse YouTube channel has all of our past webinars. Those are all free content for you to access at any time. Um, you do not need to wait to ask questions until the end, but we do ask that you ask those through the Q&A uh, feature on the right side panel. You'll see that there. You can pop a question in. We may or may not field those questions during the presentation. Most likely those will be fielded at the end. Um, but we do encourage you to go ahead and do that. Um, there will be potentially some polls that are run throughout the webinar. We encourage you to participate. That's our way to hear back from you and get a feedback to us and the speakers on what you're seeing, experiencing, what you want to see in here. And there's some handouts as well. So under the handout tab, you'll see uh, some PDFs on some of this that provide a little bit more detailed information should you need that. Um, during each uh, presentation, we're going to give you a chance to respond to that. So you don't need to chat in asking for contact information or anything. If you see a product or something that's going to be a good fit for your laboratory, um, we will provide an opportunity for you to express interest. You will also be able to express interest in multiple um, of those products and technologies, and you don't need to just pick one, right? So you can fill out that sheet. You can respond multiple times. So each, each time a presenter presents, we'll give you an opportunity to respond. Um, we do have an upcoming webinar just before we get started. Our next one, always like to tease that, is how to get in-network contracts and improve contract negotiations. Um, that is being handled by our payer strategy solutions team. That's a team that used to work on the other side of the table for um, Blue Cross and some of the commercial payers spent their career deciding which laboratories are in-network and which are not and um, how to get which ones to approve. So they're able to guide and leverage their, um, their network to get you to the table to get uh, in-network status, then most of their fees are based on success. <clears throat> All right, so getting that out of the way, quick agenda for today. Um, these are the different products that we're going to be highlighting. Uh, we're going to be starting off with uh, John Cucci uh, from AccuPath, who's going to be talking about this bladder cancer biomarker. Um, but we will be hearing from the rest of these, and I'll get into those a little bit more as we, as they pop up. So I'm going to go ahead and hand over the mic and the camera to John so he can tell us about this uh, biomarker for bladder cancer that AccuPath uh, offers. Great, John and the Lighthouse team, thank you for the opportunity to present. Uh, John Cucci, Chief Sales Officer at AccuPath Labs, also a national sales consultant for KDX Diagnostics. Uh, going to move pretty quickly here. I know we're short on time. So just quick overview slide. AccuPath is a multi-specialty anatomic pathology lab based here in New York on Long Island. Uh, KDX is a developer of uh, novel tests to detect uh, you know, cancer and the management of cancer. Um, they're based in California. We formed a partnership five years ago uh, to commercialize the Euro 17 biomarker, which we'll get into here. Since then, you know, we've performed over 25,000 tests um, you know, across the country, currently working with urology groups, commercial laboratories, um, and other types of facilities that are interested in the assay. The assay is available in different models to fit your needs and your clients' needs, whether that's global, PC only, PC only, or a full uh, lab internalization program for this, uh, this amino uh, stain. Uh, we are developing and launching a digital pathology solution this year, which will include an algorithm for Euro 17, and you'll, you'll see some of the benefits of that uh, going forward. 
So an overview of, of the assay and really our innovation here with KDX is to uh, innovate the way bladder cancer is currently detected and managed. Um, the goal here is to um, help offset some of the limitations of urine cytology, which, which is the traditional uh, screening test for patients with hematuria and the, for the detection of bladder cancer. Cy cytology is very low sensitivity. There's a lot of variability amongst pathologists when signing out cytology, and it has an especially poor sensitivity to low-grade disease. So what, uh, what uh, Euro-17 is, is an antibody that looks for the detection of keratin-17. So keratin-17 is a protein that's expressed very early on in the bladder cancer uh, development process. So before morphological changes that are observable uh, on cytology by a cytopathologist, and also before the uh, genetic changes that are required for observation by fish. So it's a, it's, a, you know, it's a crystal ball, if you will, that works very nicely in conjunction with both of those tests on the same urine specimen that basically just gives the pathologist another slide to uh, interpret and kind of use in conjunction with those others and provide uh, very valuable clinical information. Um, you know, a quick highlight about financials, it uses 88360, it's a semi-quant IHC stain, so that is a commonly uh, utilized uh, CPT code. So most payers, um, for Medicare and commercial, pay for this test you know, virtually every time. We have at Acupath over you know, 25,000 plus cases have had not had any issues with reimbursement on an in-network basis. It's cost effective, you know, about $100, $125 across the country, depending where you are, versus other tests that are on the market that are significantly more expensive than it. So it's, it adds significant clinical value, but it also is a you know, reasonably priced test and reimbursed test that you know, does not cause uh, you know, issues from an you know, out-of-network basis or uh, you know, exorbitant bills for patients that you know, would certainly cause issues as well. A uh, quick note about some statistics on it, which you, uh, plays into its applicability, of course. So we have, uh, through uh, many published papers, a 100% negative predictive value, sensitivity of 94%, and specificity of 83%. And there's, you know, those published papers are all available, of course, um, upon request. Um, how our clients are utilizing this? So basically, we're, we're looking for hematuria patients, you know, that were screening for bladder cancer, um, or patients that have had bladder cancer that have had uh, chemotherapy, and we're monitoring for recurrence. Recurrence is a major problem in bladder cancer, uh, with it recurring at around 75% of the time. So it's a, it's a big issue, uh, you know, with this specific cancer. So leveraging our NPV, if we have patients that have a negative urine cytology with a negative Euro 17, we can confirm that that patient is at a very low or no risk of bladder cancer because we know cytology on its own does miss a significant number of important um, of cancers. Um, secondly, atypical cytology is a very common diagnosis that's frustrating to clinicians. So utilizing Euro 17, we can adjudicate those cytologies, either downgrading that patient's risk profile or conversely, you know, putting them in a higher risk bucket and, you know, triaging or reflexing to other types of testing, such as Eurovision fish, cystoscopy, et cetera. Uh, Dr. Tom Jaram is a leading bladder cancer expert. He's a co-host of the Lugfa Bladder Cancer Academy uh, meeting every December. He has been an Acupad client for many years. This is a summary of how he utilizes it. I'm not going to, you know, read through every every bullet point, but he finds it very valuable in sort of the way that I outlined um, in conjunction with traditional urine cytology and fish. A uh, quick snapshot of a report: you get your standard urine cytology report. You see this says a typical. You just have the additional information of a Euro 17 uh, biomarker on that report, similar to a PIN4, uh, you know, staining on a prostate biopsy or any other kind of IHC or special staining. So you get you know, more comprehensive report with more clinical information that's, uh, you know, valuable to the patient and to the clinician. Um, uh, Interpretation-wise, very simple, three categories, negative, low, and high. Depends on the number of stain cells that the pathologist sees, either 0 to 4, 5 to 19, <clears throat> excuse me, or, or 20 or more. So it's very easy to read for a pathologist. It doesn't require um, a significant amount of training. Uh, financially, just a quick snapshot, you know, urine cytology on a global basis right now is reimbursed at around $65 nationwide. Euro 17 utilizing 88360 is about $115. So in addition to the significant clinical utility, um, you know, the financial piece is there as well for laboratories. The antibody is sold by KDX Diagnostics, Acupath. We provide the validation support and training. It's been validated and utilized on all of the main auto standards on the market. 
and with uh, you know cooperation from our clients that you could be live in a matter of a couple of weeks. So with that said, Alex, that's uh, six minutes, 15 seconds. We're good. There you go. Thank you, John. I appreciate that. A lot of good information, very precise and concise. Um, if a laboratory wanted to partner in a laboratory to laboratory um, arrangement, is that an oppor opportunity for this? Absolutely. We work with uh, many labs in that in that basis. Um, certainly the ones that, you know, want to send us cases, have us stain them, return them to the other laboratory for them to interpret um, and perhaps bring it in themselves, uh, you know, if they decided to do so. Okay. So flexibility on how that, that looks. Great. Well, thank you so much. Uh, you guys should have seen on your screen an opportunity to respond to that. If that's something you want to hear more about, please click and fill that out so that we can put you in touch with John and his team. Uh, there is also more information in the handouts about that Euro 17 test. Uh, next, we're going to be um, spotlighting Dr. Madison Kelly, and she is with the Precision Medicine team at LabCorp. And uh, Dr. Kelly is going to be talking to us about the first FDA cleared comprehensive genomic profile assay that's uh, got an FDA uh, approval on it, and we're looking forward to hearing more about that. So I'm going to turn it over to you, Dr. Kelly. Sure, thank you. Um, I'm a technical specialist at LabCorp Oncology, and today I'm going to discuss a little bit about our LabCorp Oncology solution for bringing genomics testing in-house. So over the past 20 years, there's been over 500 new FDA approvals for oncology drugs, and over 80% of those are actually targeted therapies. Therefore, it's so important that we perform molecular testing on all of our patients in order to make sure they're receiving the most effective targeted therapies. Um, usually how this is achieved is by the centralized model. And so smaller pathologists and labs will send all of their samples interstate and in most cases all the way across the country uh, to a single lab who has expertise in genomics. Um, they perform all of the testing and then there's usually about a two week turnaround time before the results and usually patient samples are sent all the way back. So we have all of the patient data samples being flown all around the country. Um, <clears throat> But now, uh, thanks to the acquisition of personal genome diagnostics a couple of years ago, LabCorp uh, Oncology can now offer an alternative to this in which we can help bring all of our genomic testing in-house. By bringing this in-house, we can reduce the turnaround time to just five days, um, which is especially a crucial in these late stage patients when even a couple of days to treatment time can make a difference in prognosis. Um, we allow labs to maintain ownership over their data and we encourage labs to leverage uh, their data for research partnerships, biopharma partnerships, uh, and clinical trial enrollment. Um, and importantly, we've secured a national PLA code for our assay with a Medicare reimbursement rate of 2,900. And this means that this is actually a financially viable uh, option or alternative for labs all across the country to implement their own in-house genomics testing. With the future of LDTs a little bit uncertain due to FDA's new proposed guidance, having an ID IVD solution is going to be more important than ever. Uh, having an IVD solution means we can eliminate the costly and timely research and development and full assay uh, validation process, which is required of LDTs. Um, and instead, we can get labs up and running with a quick verification study. Uh, we have a really supportive hands-on customer uh, service and implementation team which are with you every step of the way. We've gotten labs with little to no NDS experience up and running with their own in-house genomic testing uh, within four to six weeks, which is pretty exciting. The PGDX Ilio Tissue Complete Assay um, is a pan solid cancer comprehensive genomic profiling assay and is currently the only FDA kitted assay on the market. The assay encompasses a wet lab component, so we have a library preparation kit, uh, as well as our um, fully automated turnkey bioinformatics pipeline. Um, the pipeline use, utilizes our proprietary AI model in order to call key clinically actionable mutations while filtering out any uh, background sequencing noise and germline mutations. Importantly, what this means is that uh, no bioinformatics expertise is required in order to generate these clinically meaningful results. The pipeline itself is housed on a physical server, which we ship out to you, your institute, um, install on your internal network, meaning no internet access is required. Um, and this means that all of the data maintain, is maintained on site. 
and you maintain complete ownership over this. Um, and as I mentioned, we want to empower labs to take ownership over this uh, patient genomic sequencing data um, and to leverage this for partnerships for research and even explore as a potential new revenue stream. This quote here in the left hand of your screen is uh, from one of our collaborators and customers, Dr. Pranil Chandra, uh, who's Chief Medical Officer at PATH Group, uh, who currently run our PGDX Alio Tissue Complete Assay. Uh, and he's highlighting that until the ETC assay, um, there hasn't been a standardized TAN cancer test, which can be performed anywhere across the country. Really highlighting how impactful and innovative this assay could possibly be. So until now, uh, a lot of in-house sequencing solutions has been limited to these really large institutions who have all of the money to invest um, in like the really timely research and development phase as well as validation. Um, however, we want to make sure that this is accessible um, to as many different labs as possible. So we work really closely with our customers to develop economic models to make sure this is a financially viable solution for them. Um, here we have just an example of one of these economic models which we've developed um, where we take our reimbursement, approved reimbursement rate of 2,900 um, and we assume and we uh, calculate sort of the operating costs, um, what it would actually cost the lab to run our assay using our competitive pricing. Um, and you can see here that we have a potential margin of about 1,500. This leaves lots of room for, you know, reimbursement, uh, for adjustments um, in costs and in labor costs and everything like that. So um, uh, even with a uh, low reimbursement rate of only about 60%, you can see that labs not only break even, but this could actually be profitable for many labs to run. So I really truly believe that the future of precision medicine lies in improving the accessibility uh, to cutting, ad cutting edge technologies such as these. And I look forward to working with LabCorp Oncology to make this reality. Uh, thank you so much for tuning in. Um, thank you, Lighthouse, for the opportunity to present this. Uh, if you want more information, we have an ETC flyer in the handout section, um, or feel free to pop a question in the Q&A. We're more than happy to chat science at any time. Hey, John, I think you're on mute. Yeah. Uh, yeah, we're not hearing you right Sorry now. Dude. Thank you. Yep. Thank you, Dr. Kelly. I was just uh, trying to clarify one question, which was the uh, wet lab portion of that. Does that sequencer sit on the customer site or does that um, wet lab sequencing happen in a centralized location? Yeah, so it all happens on site. So we use the Illumina NextSeq. Um, and so we work with labs on how best to get that sequencing on site. Uh, we also work with third parties if they need to get a third party sequencing solution as well. Perfect. Okay. Thank you so much. All right. Well, we are have up next Stacy Coth, who's going to be uh, talking to us about a proprietary buffer that they have, iSwab, um, which helps, uh, as I understand it, uh, preserve human DNA, also the bacterial DNA for uh, prevent contamination and testing. So, Stacy, why don't you tell us a little bit more about that? Thanks, John. Hi, everybody. I'm Stacy Koth. I'm the Scientific Business Development Manager at Maui DNA Technologies. Um, I want to give thanks to Alex and John and the Lighthouse Lab Service team for the opportunity to shine some light on Maui DNA Technologies, founded by our founder and innovator, Dr. Bassam Elfamawi. In this showcase, I'm going to highlight just a high level overview of who we are and what we do and how we support genomic and diagnostic service organizations, you know, enabling and allowing workflow improvements for NGS and RT PCR assays. As you can see on this slide, um, our portfolio of products. Um, we have a variety of products, but um, that span dependent on sample type applications and downstream workflows. In this showcase, I'm going to highlight our iSwab DNA collection device, which is the only DNA collection device on the market that controls the spread of bacterial DNA contamination. As mentioned, we're a global leader in non-invasive biological sample collection devices. 
um, supporting genomic and diagnostic service organizations to obtain high quality and high quantity DNA from biological samples at room temperature, and also additionally, minimizing QNS failure rates by controlling the spread of bacterial DNA contamination. Oftentimes we're hearing in conversation some of the following issues, frustrations, or concerns when it comes to sample collection. Um, many times we hear about low DNA, so not enough starting material to head into your workflows. Uh, high bacterial DNA content in samples, which ultimately results in high failure rates and reworks devices that aren't swab, uh, that aren't automated friendly. Additionally to having to deal with swabs throughout your downstream processes. Our proprietary buffer is such it's non-toxic. It's free of formaldehyde and alcohols. It's an allelic buffer, which allows for a gentle lysis. This results in longer pieces of double-stranded genomic DNA. Um, with the selective lysis as well, and as mentioned, with these chemistries, a bacterial DNA is encapsulated at the point of collection, inhibiting further proliferation of bacterial DNA. Once samples are collected, uh, swabs are discarded as you head into your downstream workflows. So just a little snapshot, snapshot of our patented device which is designed as, what, as such to retrieve the highest of DNA yields. Once again, a quick story to share as well as we talk about workflow improvements, um, a cost-effective solution, how to increase your pro productivity and operational efficiencies. Um, we had a current partner in particular that adopted the iSwab DNA collection device, previously having turnaround times sample to answer as about eight to 10 days. And then once adopting the iSwab DNA collection device, that was reduced to a two day turnaround time for customers and or um, test users receiving the results. So if you can imagine with using, um, dealing with such large high volumes of tests and samples being done on automation, this is quite the workflow improvement. On the right here too, demonstrating just visually um, with three different types of extraction kits, what the, the quality and quantity of high quality pure genomic DNA. I'm a little bit shorter than everybody else, but you know, on our end, we have an open in invitation here to connect. If by chance um, workflow improvements, uh, direct and in indirect cost savings is a 2024 strategy of yours, um, we'd welcome the opportunity to engage in a discovery call, learn about your current workflows in particular, and you can contact me directly. Um, I know Alex also posted a flyer of the iSwab DNA collection device as well. Um, you can also uh, take a look at the Maui DNA Technologies website. There's lots of reference papers and application notes uh, citing how our devices are being used or follow us on LinkedIn. And I'm also recognizing already from the first two presenters that Within, uh, additionally, there looks like there could be some areas of collaboration as well as you pre presented. Thanks so much. Thank you, Stacy. Really appreciate that. Um, I'm going to take a quick break here to just push forward to you guys something that I think is really important and timely, and that is we're dealing with this uh, FDA potential rule that would require all LDTs to receive approval through the FDA. Um, it would make um, today's LDT market look very different. And it uh, looks like the estimates on getting LDTs approved by the FDA, most that I've seen are in excess of a million dollars per LDT, uh, which I don't think is very tenable. And I know for most 
labs that we work with is going to be financially burdensome, never mind the time involved with going through that process in order to have all your LDTs continue to be available to your customers. And so I wanted to give you an opportunity to respond to some advocacy er efforts that we have. Um, we did a fly-in last week and met with 15 different senators and congressmen's offices to highlight the importance of LDTs. If you'd like to be part of that, we, we need more um, people polling with us, and we're hoping to highlight laboratories that are in the districts of these different legislators. So respond to um, that push out if that's something that you also feel strongly about, and we'll try to find ways for you to connect. It might be locally giving a tour of your laboratory to uh, an elected official or their team, or coming in, we're gonna have two more fly-ins into DC to meet with us in different uh, legislators uh, to talk to them about the importance of the work that you guys are doing and we'll try to match you up with legislators in your district. So I want to take a minute to highlight that since we are talking about innovation today and that is a threat to innovation in my opinion. Um, next we're going to be hearing from Chris Hefner who's the VP over at Chorus CAD and he's going to be talking to us about a cardiac screening test. So Chris I'll go ahead and I'll hand over the mic to you. All right thank you Alex. Uh, one point of clarification there I, I have uh, I do have a, a pretty extensive background in medical, but I am uh, retired from medical sales. Um, however, the ownership grew at uh, Coors CAD uh, because of my familiarity with the test. I actually sold the test in uh, doctor's offices for many years. And uh, because of my familiarity with it and, and understanding of the clinical utility, they kind of called me out of semi retirement to make the presentation for them. Uh, so uh, I happily obliged. Um, I'll get right to it in the interest of time. Um, what is Coors CAD? In layman's terms, uh, it uh, determines a patient's likelihood of if they have a blockage from coronary artery disease prior to going to the cath lab. It's a very unique test in that it's a, it's a simple blood draw. It only requires a single tube of blood. There's no fasting required and it doesn't even need to be spun down. And I, that's significant for obvious reasons, but I think it's particularly significant when you're thinking about the types of patients we're talking about. Patient presents in office, physician suspects possibly has a blockage, uh, they can draw the blood right there on the spot. They don't have to call the patient back the next day or days later. Uh, you really cut down that window uh, of identifying a, a possible uh, major problem with the patient. Uh, it's a genomic test, it's not a genetic test. So it's looking on what's going on in the patient's body right that mo moment in time. Um, it has a one to 40 score and it's derived from the gene expression levels plus the age and the sex of the patient, and tests are generally available within uh, three to four days after the blood draw. Uh, it's got strong clinical performance, as you can see there from the slide. Uh, it's 96% negative predictive value. So in other words, if a patient has a low score, uh, highly, highly likely they do not have a blockage, and so they don't have to go to the cath lab for that expensive and obviously very invasive procedure. This slide here just kind of speaks to uh, the correlation between CAD scores uh, and whether or not the patient actually had a blockage. Uh, you can see there again, one through 15, very low uh, likelihood that they had a blockage. As you move into moderate levels, 16 to 27 on the score, that's probably gonna be a, a patient the physician is gonna uh, order more diagnostic testing for, maybe some imaging prior to the cath lab. And then you can see there at the very end, the 28 to 40, what would be considered kind of a high score uh, course cab, that's gonna be the patient. You see greater than 50% likelihood that they have a blockage. Again, it's helping to, it's giving another diagnostic tool for a physician to identify a patient that's a, a high likelihood for a blockage prior to sending to the cath lab. This slide here just kind of speaks to uh, patient uh, flow through an office or uh, through the diagnostic testing procedure and also a doctor's uh, physician, uh, physician's decision tree, excuse me. Uh, again, uh, underscoring the fact that if a patient has a low score, 15 or less, no further cardiac testing is generally needed, but as you move through the higher scores, then you additionally, you, a physician would typically be triggered to order additional uh, diagnostic testing. But this comes, this, this bottom, uh, these bullet points here come from one of the studies from Course Cab. You see it reduced uh, MPI procedures by 46%, reduced actual cap cardiac cast by 29%, and then that bottom, that bottom bullet point about improving diagnostic yield, obviously that speaks to the fact that once the patients that had the higher scores actually got to the cath lab, they were far more likely to uh, have a blockage than the general population. So again, a, a very user-friendly and a way of identifying patients before you send them to that uh, invasive, expensive procedure. I uh, won't spend a lot of time on this, this slide here because everybody on the call is very smart, but again, it just 
It highlights the difference between genomic and genetic testing. Genomic testing, of course, is measuring RNA. In other words, what's going on in the patient's body right that moment in time. And then DNA testing, genetic testing would be uh, what, the, what could be happening down the line in that patient's body. But uh, of course, cardiac course CAD is a genomic test. So it's identifying what's going on in the body right that moment in time. This just this slide here just speaks to who the course CAD is intended for. Uh, men and women ages 21 to 85 with typical symptoms of uh, obstructive coronary artery disease. Obviously those would include chest pain or shortness of breath, but you can also include uh, the patients will be appropriate for course CAD testing would be atypical symptoms such as dizziness or nausea, and then one additional cardiovascular risk factor such as high blood pressure, high cholesterol, things of that nature. Um, and then you can, you can read there where, who of course, CAD is not intended to. I think the, the not intended to piece there kind of speaks to the old adage of that, that absence of evidence is not evidence of absence. Uh, it's just that those patients were not studied in the clinical trials with course CAD. Moving on, uh, this, this slide here just, just speaks to the extensiveness of, of how well course CAD has been studied over the years. You can read for yourself that, that 23 papers published in peer-reviewed journals, over 60 abstracts presented at, at uh, uh, scientific meetings, and then it answers all the different various studies answered some of those key questions over there. How accurate and reproducible is the test? You see the studies that spoke to that. How does the test perform in, in various populations? Those studies speak to that. And then how does it influence in clinical decisions, right? So if you're, you, it's great that you're running a test, but it, how is it impacting the actual clinical decisions of uh, physicians, and you can see the various studies there that speak to that. This slide here um, is one of the very most important slides in, in the entire slide deck. Uh, this looked at a 2010 study from the New England Journal of Medicine, retrospectively looking at over or approximately 400,000 patients who were referred to the cath lab. Of those 400,000 some odd patients, 62% of the patients that were sent to the cath lab did not actually have an obstructive. Uh, obstruction. So let me say that again for emphasis. 62% of these 400,000 patients did not actually have a blockage. And that's really how uh, a test like course CAD was born because of that huge need uh, to have a tool to rule in or rule out patients prior to going through again an expensive uh, invasive procedure such as the cath lab. I'm going to skip over that slide because it kind of says the same thing a different way. Um, in summary, um, course CAD has a 96% negative value, negative predictive value. Uh, so if patients had a low score, they, they generally did not have a blockage. So it helps clinicians make rule out decisions prior to sending to the cath lab or ordering uh, imaging uh, diagnostic testing. Uh, it can lo obviously lower out of, co out of pocket costs. As we all know, cath labs are, are hugely expensive. Um, so it lowers costs in that way. Convenient, again, it couldn't get any user friendly single tube of blood doesn't have to be drawn down uh, and the patient doesn't have to be uh, fasting. And of course, there's less risk with that. I mean, right, there's no radiation, there's no contrast dye used, so much less risk for the patient. Finally, it's sex specific. Uh, it's obviously, it's, it's built in uh, gender differences and, and, and how genes express themselves. Uh, so it's specific. Every patient has a unique score, in other words, uh, both men and women. Uh, here's a, speaking to something significant as well. This comes from a 2017 scientific uh, statement from the American Heart Association. Uh, in this scientific statement, they were actually speaking about a number of uh, diagnostic tests, but I think the key line there as it relates to course CAD, they said the American Heart Association said, the course CAD test is a clinically available diagnostic tool that has been evaluated and has been deemed to be valid and useful. Uh, so pretty high praise from the American Heart Association. Kind of in summary. Thank you, Chris. And we got to wrap pretty quick here. So okay. You All right. Um, last two things. Um, there's the procedure code. There's the reimbursement information. Uh, it is covered in the Novitas and First Coast Max. And uh, as far as what the ownership group is looking for, they are looking for um, looking for buying the asset, but they are open to a down payment and a structured buyout over time. So uh, appreciate the time, everyone. And uh, sorry for maybe running. No, no problem. And so, yeah, that's one cool thing to highlight just real quick. This test has been established, and the reason we have it on today is that um, it came off the market 
um, due to the group that owned the IT no longer being in existence. It was auctioned off. An independent group has it. They're looking for a lab to help them commercialize that, and they're open to either selling that IP to another group that wants to use the test or work in with them on a payout model on a per click. So I thought it was just interesting that we got this cool test out there that does really important work but needs a, a <laughs> laboratory partner or group to kind of push that forward. So if you're interested in that, go ahead and respond, and we'll get you guys connected to Chris's group. Um, next, we have up uh, Dr. Rick Patel, who's uh, going to talk to us about uh, validity testing. He's got a second generation validity test, and the uh, uh, use of synthetic urines is always becoming a, a bigger issue. So he's going to tell us a little bit about um, a solution for that. Go ahead, Rick. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for taking part of your lunchtime uh, to listen to these very good presentations. And I want to thank Lighthouse Lab Services for the opportunity to present this information to you. So what I'm going to speak to you about are various means by which individuals can subvert their urine drug screen. And what Validity Diagnostics has done is put out a series of reagents they classify as second generation as vast improving those of the first generation. So let's say you have a laboratory that's running urine drug screens. You have the classic uh, immunoassay screen. Perhaps your lab was set up by laboratories services such as Lighthouse. You're running your screens. You get a presumptively positive screen result. Generally, unless the physician knows that the person is taking the particular drug, you want to have that confirmed by a more specific analytical method of analysis such as GCMS or LCMS. However, let's say a new patient comes into the lab and has a drug screen. Presumably, a presumptive negative sample is good. However, what if there's a question from the physician that's been established as a uh, drug compliance patient? They're negative. They're supposed to be positive. That could be a question. Let's say there's a new patient that came in they want to get an opiate uh, prescription and they're negative. So then the question becomes, has that urine sample been subverted? Is it true urine that's negative or is there something going on with it? So that's what we are going to deal with here today. The use of sample validity tests to detect subversion of urine drug screens has uh, twofold. Number one, on the clinical side of things, there is no requirement for urine sample validity testing. If a lab performs the urine sample validity test, the lab will not be paid for those tests. So a lot of uh, clinical laboratories say, well, if I'm not going to be paid, I'm not going to run it. Well, that could turn out to be a liability down the line. For workplace and federal policies, Specimen validity tests must be performed, and at a minimum, you detect creatinine and pH. And if creatinine is low, then you run a specific gravity test. In addition to that, you have to have one or more oxidizing agents. The problem is between synthetic urine being imi imitation urine and the art of subversion People now have looked to innovate and improve upon the first generation of specimen validity tests, and that's where validity diagnostics comes in. As we found, when the level of subversion increases, the detection of drugs in urine decreases. However, we all know that many drug abuse deaths have occurred and have been increasing over the past few years. In addition to that, the economic cost of drug abuse has also increased. So if there's negatives out there that shouldn't be negative, you wouldn't know it unless you had a good specimen validity test panel to perform on each sample. And as um, a side note, it's uh, looked like the rate of detection of failed validity tests of the millions of samples that are run each year is less than 0.5% and that the level of detection of oxidizing adulterants is close to zero. So if we take a look at uh, one of the big 
reasons, a lot of negative samples come in that shouldn't be negative, and that's the use of synthetic urine. You have a variety of synthetic urine manufacturers that set out to perfect a human urine so that it passes all the first generation specimen validity test, and that would include pH, specific gravity, creatinine, urea, uric acid, and several other components. Now you would think, why would someone add uric acid to a synthetic urine? Well, some of the labs have used uric acid in the past as a biomarker for human urine. The synthetic urine manufacturers found out about that and now start adding uric acid to the mix. You also have what we call the art of subversion. The art of subversion of several companies out there selling detox drinks containing masking agents, and they give you specific instructions on how to use the particular drink. With tests that we run, one particular masking agent with detox drinks, you drink the drink, void several times, and that would give you a buffer zone of two to three hours where you would go in and collect your uh, urine and it would be clean. So what Validity Diagnostics did is they put forth a second generation of urine specimen validity test. And what they did is they looked at each component, how each component was being defeated by products on the market, whether it's synthetic urine or with uh, masking agents or with detox drinks and they approved upon it. So for the pH, it's a dual indicator. For creatinine, they put a decolorizing agent. For specific gravity, they change specific gravity and call it a specific gravity index. So what they're doing here is they're enzymatically determining the total potassium and sodium ions, and that would help to explain uh, situations where this urine creatinine fails, but in the first generation, you reflex to specific gravity, it passes, but it would, it would not pass the specific gravity index test of validity diagnostics. Then for the oxidants, based upon the low level of detection of oxidizing agents in the commercial laboratories that use the first generation of specimen validity test, they change the mechanism by which oxidants are detected by looking at urine biomarkers that would generally be decreased if an oxidizing agent was used. And based upon the uh, validity diagnostic oxidant history test, you can detect a lot more of the use of uh, oxidizing agents. Lastly, the uh, detection of counterfeit, substituted, or synthetic urine. Counterfeit urine could be uh, lab-based. You put uh, water with some B vitamins together. That could be considered a counterfeit urine. A substituted urine is when you borrow someone else's urine and then um, somehow warm it up prior to your test so it would pass the temperature test, and that can be used, as well as the big one, synthetic urine. So for synthetic urine and for substituted and counterfeit urine, Validity Diagnostics put together a series of reagents of true urine, LD and SD, which are used to detect proteins in the urine that would generally come from the uh, urinary tract. So with this particular system, you can uh, find that uh, several tests that would pass with synthetic urine under the first generation would fail under the uh, true urine LD and SD. And then finally, as a summary, the first generation of uh, specimen validity test, the detection threshold of some of these reagents are set low, so that can give rise to false positives. The perfect synthetic urine can uh, be detected by some first-generation test, but most generation tests 
would fail to detect the perfect synthetic urine. We talked about the low level of uh, oxidant adulteration that's detected. Hey, Rick, I'm sorry to, sorry to interrupt here, but uh, in the interest of getting our last two speakers on, you're a couple minutes over and we're going to need to move it along. Okay. We have handouts and uh, in the handout section, and if you need to contact me, um, they'll have my contact information in there. And thank you for the opportunity of uh, sharing this information with you. All right. Thank you very much, Rick. That's uh, super helpful. And I know that's a major issue with the opioid crisis right now. So we need as many tools as we can have. We're going to be bringing on uh, Lee Springer next. And Lee is going to be talking to us about an AI-backed software uh, that helps with capturing and importing lab recs and uh, insurance info. So Lee, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to turn over the controls to you. Awesome. Thank you. I'm going to share my screen here because I got to be different than everyone in everyone else here. So uh, welcome everyone and thank you for attending. Uh, as healthcare professionals, we know that paper is involved in everything within healthcare, from every process to every department to really every facet. And we know that paper is a source of patient delay. We know it's a source of process bottleneck. We also know it's a source of error when it comes to clerical or transcription error. Well, when we look at the laboratory field, we know that the paper requisition is the predominant piece of paper that we use with in the everyday processes. And if you look at the number of lab orders placed per year, you look at the estimated percentages of those based upon all of, all of the CDC information, it's really an astonishing one out of three orders are gonna be submitted via paper. Uh, <clears throat> now, that's a large percentage for you know, potential error. But it's also a, a source of time and money with eight minutes it taking to enter one and the cost of $2.26. Lab Savvy looked to solve this problem and using AI and machine learning technology, we can scan a requisition, we can scan a demographic form and insurance all in one fail swoop, regardless of the, uh, the order it's in uh, and in batch or in say like single. And this is done through a few different ways. So we use intelligent character recognition to ID written and typed and printed information. We lean on machine learning through some various algorithms and module processes to really translate that into more of a, say, like a segregation of symbols and natural language. And then we have software bots that will gather and store the information that helps with the learning processes as it goes. And through some proprietary means, we combine this all with a control logic, which in real time helps to coordinate all of the other aspects into an automated extraction and recognition process. So this accelerates the knowledge at which it can learn. And really it's not dependent on any type of explicit programming. We just basically say, this is what you're looking for. Here's the fields and we let it learn. And in this aspect, uh, we can do this with a database. If you wanted to make sure and had, had access to ICD-10 codes, you could have that. The example that I show you is raw. There is no database behind it. It's just what we asked it to pull out. And this helps accelerate the learning. So it's a scan, review, submit process. So just log in. And you'll see here we're going to log in so you can track and audit who's actually processing the actual uh, docutized aspect. You're going to scan it. So any scanner um, can do low or high volume. And you see in this one, we're gonna have a lab requisition and insurance form and a demographics. This is where those software bots and AI come in to docutize it. And now we review. So it's just taken a few seconds to get here. We're gonna pull up the file to be reviewed and you see it displays it nice on that left side. And this is what we asked it to find. So you can see as you go through the check within each box, it's gonna highlight those for you. So it makes it easier to do a one-to-one. -one. And again, this doesn't have any database behind it. It's just raw knowledge. And you can see it thought those Zs were twos, which we did that on purpose. We have some various checks in there. We're gonna move into the insurance aspect. So it's rapidly gathering the information um, and easy peasy for that there. Now we move on to their demographic form and you see this is all moving real fast. This is actually a real-time process. 
So you see that nice little highlight as it checks. You can see how someone can move through that very fast. We're checking the information. There's nothing flagged. And you can set your, uh, say, like tolerance levels to whatever you want, whether it be 90, 80, 100%, and you submit it. So we have one last step to do the review. And you see the uh, requisition on the left side there. And you see the summary of it. And it's as easy as that. You can verify and you submit. That's going to send that um, into the LIS or EMR system in an HL7 format in just 90 seconds. So we had a very simple requisition there. Um, any style of requisition, no matter how, say, like complicated it is, we can train it to learn that and digest it. And then it can extract all of the information that you want. Now, your first scan is going to be accurate out of the box. Your 100 scan is going to be even more accurate. So as it goes on, it's going to learn. It's going to be able to predict things just like if you train an employee. As they do their job more, they become more and more proficient at it. This is proficient off the shelf, and it learns even more as it goes. And that's pretty much the power of lab savvy in uh, as fast a process as it takes to process an entire order. Well, thank you very much, Lee. I love seeing uh, innovation on the administrative side, too. That enables all the rest of the stuff to happen. And so it's certainly a place where we need more of it. Um, and then we're going to be bringing up our last speaker. And so if you have an interest in uh, responding to Lab Savvy, please do so. And we'll get you connected with Lee. Um, last, we have uh, Dr. Vamsi Pamula. And um, potentially the most mind-blowing uh, technology advancement that I, I saw. And so I'm looking forward to allowing him to present this to you. I got to walk through this laboratory. And Vamsi uh, is uh, an interesting guy. He's got 420 patents um, to his name, which is the most I've ever heard of by one human being. So I think you'll enjoy what he's, uh, he's going to present to you. So I'll go ahead and I'll turn it over to you, Vamsi. All right. Th <clears throat> thank you, John. Can you uh, see the slides and hear me? Yes. Yep, we see you and hear you. All right, sounds good. Thank you. Thanks for the introduction and the opportunity to present here. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Vamsi Pamula, and I'll present how uh, multifunctional testing can maximize diagnostic yield on a digital microfluidic platform. <clears throat> this is how a point of care lab looks like today. Uh, Space is a premium in physician's office labs, uh, urgent care centers, and EDs. I took this picture of a POCT lab in a large uh, local pediatrician's practice here when I took my son there recently. Um, that's it. There is no more place for uh, any additional instruments. Uh, even if space was made available uh, for all the single function instruments, such as uh, one for immunoassays, one for uh, molecular, yet another one for coagulation and one more for chemistry, it takes prep time to run all these instruments individually. And then keeping them, uh, keeping the staff uh, proficient on all these uh, these many single function test uh, devices uh, requires continuous training, taking time away from patient care. For example, if a patient walked into a clinic for HCV diagnosis, at least three uh, different platforms would be required uh, before prescribing antivirals. One for antibody testing, another for quantitative PCR. And, and then one more for uh, liver fibrosis testing, requiring three different single function devices. Similarly, a patient with trauma will require chemistry, immunoassays, and coagulation assays. And then sepsis would require even more types of tests. Currently, many single function devices are required to deliver efficient and effective patient care in distributed settings. Uh, patient symptoms don't come classified into assay methodologies. So is it possible to combine all these disparate and disjointed tests and put them into a single multifunctional platform? Yes, it is. Should it be done? In some cases, more so than others. So let's see how. With uh, digital microfluidics, our technology, uh, we have built a basic toolkit of uh, droplet operations such as dispense, mix, split, and dispose to build any complex assay protocols from this basic set of uh, building blocks. Uh, magnetic bead washing is another building block that opens up uh, uh, immune assays for us. Similarly, by building heaters and sensors right onto the disposable itself, we've been able to achieve ultra rapid PCR, PCR in, in minutes. Uh, in this case, you see a droplet shuttling 
back and forth between two heat zones, a hot zone and a cool, uh, a hot zone and a cold zone, um, 95 and 60. And each time it goes back and forth, that's one cycle of uh, PCR. And you can see the signal, the fluorescent signal building up as PCR uh, uh, proceeds. This is how originally it was done by uh, Carrie Mullis, the inventor of PCR, uh, by uh, taking liquid between two heat baths. We do that uh, more efficiently. Um, the distance between those two heat zones is only two millimeters, uh, about two millimeters or so. So in a very short distance, we are able to uh, do this. And then that, that allows us to do PCR within minutes. In this case, this was a SARS-CoV-2 Delta sample. In two minutes, we were able to uh, get a CT and to complete all the 50, uh, cycle, 40 uh, or so cycles uh, in five minutes, we finished that. So to drive these uh, digital microfluidic cartridges, we developed uh, the Finder instrument. Finder is a multiple award winning platform. And we are most proud of uh, AACC's uh, Disruptive uh, Technology Award and also the People's Choice Award. <clears throat> so I'll show you how we attain this multifunctionality on this platform. So in this video, we show how a drop of blood is loaded in 50 microliters. Uh, we split that drop of blood into um, multiple droplets, uh, each about a microliter or so. For size, this is the size of a uh, business card. And we, we actually prepare plasma on the cartridge without any centrifugation. You see plasma prepared, and we, we, we do a number of tests with plasma. In this case, we are doing bilirubin and albumin as endpoint uh, colorimetric assays. We have full spectrum. Uh, colorimetry on, on this platform. And uh, another droplet, we take it as whole blood, lyse it, and do a rate kinetic uh, fluorimetric enzymatic assay for G6PD. Uh, so as you can see, we have plasma and whole blood on the same cartridge at the same time, one going through rate kinetic fluorescence and the other going through endpoint uh, uh, absorbance. Similarly, uh, we added uh, chemistry and coagulation onto the same cartridge using a similar method where we prepare plasma on the cartridge with a drop of whole blood. Uh, this is actually reagents getting rehydrated. We prepare the, re uh, prepare the reagents, reconstitute all the dried reagents on the cartridge, prepare plasma, do a rate kinetic assay for um, antifactor 10A in this case, and we combine that with uh, an assay for viscoelastic testing for coagulation for APTT. Uh, in this case, you'll see that the droplet, as it moves back and forth, we can measure the viscosity of that droplet, how it's evolving, and from there calculate the uh, uh, APTT value. And you, you can imagine that that technique can be uh, extended to PTE, uh, fibrinogen, and a whole bunch of other uh, viscoelastic uh, methods. In this case, we we took we built when COVID uh, um, uh, happened, we added heaters and sensors right onto the cartridge and we started doing PCR on the same cartridge. Uh, basically load in BTM and then we, we do a whole a number of steps to um, uh, collect the viral nucleic acids onto magnetic beads, clean the magnetic beads and do um, our ultra rapid PCR in four to seven minutes or so. Um, <clears throat> and of late, we we have we have now uh, started clinical trials on uh, combining flu A, flu B, RSV, and uh, SARS-CoV-2 from a single VTM sample uh, within about 15 minutes, all the way from sample to answer. So the VTM gets loaded here. We lyse the sample on the cartridge, uh, mix it with uh, binding buffer. After binding is done, we we are actually uh, reconstituting the master mix uh, reagents here, and after that we collect everything on magnetic beads, clean up the magnetic beads, and take it to this uh, zone where we do the shuttle P re RT step and then shuttle PCR. And, and this whole thing is done from sample input to answer in about 15 minutes or so. We've also uh, looked at um, taking a drop of blood, extracting uh, mRNA from that uh, drop of blood and doing a 12-plex PCR in this case, RT-PCR, to look at host response for uh, neonatal sepsis. We were looking at bacterial infection versus versus no infection. And we, we have expanded this, extended this to a much uh, higher plex. Again, it's the same, same method, underlying methodology using the same building blocks. 
Our first FDA clear test is for uh, G6PD, which is the most uh, prevalent enzymatic deficiency in the world with about 400 million people affected. In a study performed with Duke and other centers, find the G6PD as a correlated strongly with the gold standard method. Columbia, Cornell, and Montefiore are currently using this, find, this uh, the uh, find the G6PD test. And additionally, we are also working on a number of other assay panels. All these tests with different samples are all performed on the same cartridge, each with different reagents and different droplet traffic routes, essentially using these uh, Lego-like building blocks. And all these are run on the same instrument platform. So in conclusion, Digital microfluidics is uh, a proven technology. Uh, I didn't even talk about it. We, we have shipped uh, about 18 million tests. Every sixth baby born in the US is tested uh, with our technology for uh, in newborn screening labs. Uh, this is the first uh, multifunctional platform combining chemistry, PCR, coagulation, immune assays, of late hematology and microbiology also. Uh, we launched our first uh, G6PD uh, test on, um, on Finder. Um, it's FDA cleared and we are seeking commercial placements now. Uh, it's a we have a very robust uh, multifunctional pipeline, flu A, flu B, RSV, SARS-CoV-2, PCR test, anti-factor 10A uh, as a chemistry test for uh, coagulation, HCV, quantitative PCR for viral load testing, STIs as PCR tests and, and many other uh, cardiac and uh, coagulation assays. And we are also always looking for uh, uh, preclinical and clinical testing sites and and uh, looking at uh, new ideas new markers that could be uh, ported over to our platform thank you vamsi uh, just really really cool stuff hope you guys enjoyed that uh, thank you to all of our speakers um, again if you're interested you want to hear more we're going to give you one more chance here to um, just express that interest. I'll pop it out to your screen so you can respond and we'll get you connected afterwards. Um, we really feel that innovation is what's going to drive lab medicine forward and we want to um, connect cool ideas with people in the marketplace that are aware of these needs. So thank you to all the speakers. We want to be respectful of our uh, attendees time because I know we're just over the hour. So thank you. We hope you'll join us again for our next webinar. Have a great day everybody.